Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. And this is Rebecca. Welcome to the making and the remaking of a codependent mind. We're very honored to have Rebecca here with us today. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Thank you for having me. She, in part because she is still in the thick of things in terms of struggling to codependent behaviors and what they say about the the relationships in her life and how those relationships may need to be reconfigured. Is that, is that fair to say, Rebecca? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we certainly want to spend some time exploring that moment, which I think a lot of people go through and probably most of our listeners have gone through when you, you, you're kind of coming to a lot of these realizations and you're looking around you and you're thinking about what about these relationships that I have? Are they serving me? How are they connected to, to my past? But let's, let's talk a little bit about that past, which has a lot of similarities. Some of the people we've talked to, and, and always there's some, some interesting differences as well. Yeah. I mean, so, you guys always start with the, the family of origin, so you can start there. As we know, it all comes from, comes from way back. One of the things that I liked that you guys both said was capital T versus little t, you know, the capital trauma when we think of the worst of the worst, right? Which I didn't experience, but I experienced multiple little traumas. And as I grew up, I always remember thinking something isn't right. And I'll figure this out in my 30s. I don't know why. When I would have enough information and experience and I don't know. I just always knew I'd figure it out later. And I've been figuring it out for probably eight to 10 years. And I'm in my 40s now. So so I was right in that way. I mean, I was raised in a Catholic family. My mom is the oldest daughter of 12 children, Irish Catholic. Yeah. So there may have been some trauma there. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. And, and I realize, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, about how it affected me. Well, I can talk about it now. So my mom was basically the second mom to all her siblings, to the point where when my grandma had her youngest, she had three sets of twins in a row. I mean, total, total Catholic, Irish Catholic family. And the last set, my mom was 12. She had to um, stay home and do all the cooking, all the cleaning, everything in the house while my grandma was in the hospital for like a month. Um, so my mom's had a lot on her shoulders for a long time. So she's had to be this, what's it called? Parentification, right? She had to be the parent when she was a child. At 12, she became a mother at 12. At yeah. 12, at 12, yeah. And when one of the younger um, sets of twins came home from school in grade two, um, there was a letter sent home saying that they couldn't read. And it was my mom's job to teach them for some reason. So I always, always heard growing up that kids should know how to read before kindergarten. And my older brother, I have two brothers, I'm in the middle. My older brother could read at four. He would read the sports section over my dad's shoulder of the newspaper. And I didn't, I would have rather have been outside riding my bike, living it up. I, I just, it wasn't what fueled me. And I always felt bad about that, that I struggled. So right from the get go, my mom's issues, she said, I wasn't going to have my kids that happened to my kids. So I was forced to read and write way earlier than I was ready for. Mm -hmm. And then having kids of my own, I realized that isn't even a, close to an expectation entering kindergarten. And unfortunately, I see it in my younger brother's child, my mom babysitting them, forcing them to learn how to read. And it's like some sort of like notch on your special, your good, if you can read. I didn't actually unpack this until about seven, eight years ago when I I got a, a degree in adult education and having to write about myself, I realized, wow, for 30 something years, her issues were projected onto me. I get why she didn't want that to happen, but I don't agree with the fact that I had to be the one dealing with her issues. Her shame. Her shame. So you ended up internalizing that as your own shame. 
not smart, can't trust myself, never liked reading, which is interesting because I don't recall watching my parents read that many books, but yet I always felt shame that I didn't like to read. Like all these things start to make sense as you get older. Like this is shame that was put on me for all of their crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the codependent spectrum, which I have to say, until I found you guys, there was nothing or that I didn't couldn't find. And I mean, I searched to say that I always found it was either like narcissist, like they're fully on board as a narcissist. And that never resonated with me. So when you guys talk about the spectrum, I'm like, finally, it makes sense because there is a spectrum. And like Brian's experienced both. I've experienced both. It's there was a lot of pressure in my childhood. There was, yeah, feeling not smart right from the get go. That was a role that was given to me. The pressure coming mostly from your mom, from your mother to, to be something. Yes. Yeah. And then my dad, he was the, the funny guy. Everybody had to like him. But what we learned as we grew was that he was a bit of a different person outside the house than he was inside the house. So we walked on eggshells around him a lot in my teens. What did that look like outside the house? How he was the funny guy. He was the life of the party. He was the jokester. I remember kids saying, your dad's so cool. And it was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 like I wanted to believe that he was the cool guy, but yet in the house, it wasn't always like that. So you didn't find yourself trying to make him the fun guy. <laughs> not make him the fun guy, but make sure that we were not doing anything that would make him the not fun guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember sitting at the kitchen table and I mean, my brothers and I had a good relationship and, and I just remember talking to my younger brother and just being told to just be quiet and eat. And I don't ever remember yelling and, and screaming with him. Maybe we had a disagreement. So it just made him uncomfortable and he just wanted everybody just to shut up. And then my mom would get mad at him for that. Then we'd have to deal with the awkwardness between them. And it just, oh, even now that triggers me. So a lot of management in both your parents. Yeah, absolutely. And then you mentioned the growing up Catholic. Were there any messages from the church uh, about who you needed to be and in, in the ways in which you maybe were not living up to that? Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, the biggest one, no sex before marriage. Go to church every Sunday or or you got to go and confess your sins before you go to church the next time because then you can't get the Holy Communion if you miss any church ever. I remember one time, I remember my mom would constantly be like, sing, sing at church. And I, I don't, I have a memory of her telling me at a different time I wasn't a good singer. Hmm. So it's like this disconnect of like, mm -hmm. You're telling me to do something that I'm being, I'm forced here. Well, I, I, not even forced. There was no discussion. It was basically, you lived in this house. The expectation was you're going to church on Sunday. Um, I had a similar experience later in life with dancing where I was told by someone that I needed to dance, but I told by the same person that I was no good at it. <laughs> <laughs> this was R. This was R, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it kind of gave me trauma surrounded, uh, attached to dancing. Right? Yeah. I remember when we got married being told like sing in the car like go like go ahead and sing and then I did and then there was shame around it and it's like what is happening here nothing feels safe so I guess that's that I mean that you know we were talking about the codependency spectrum and and small t and, and big t trauma the kind of chronic lack of safety I think is is one way to understand small t trauma yeah being dismissed or overruled, mm -hmm. or, yeah. which which you know makes you feel unsafe. Like yeah. if you the sense of you never really know if you're safe and secure in the relationship, whether it's a relationship with your parent or then as you move forward in any relationship. And so, in order to manage that, you follow suit. You make yourself small. You don't pay attention to your emotions. If you are, if you're able to recognize your emotions, you deny it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So you emerge from this household with this sense of being unsafe and into relationships where that played out as well. Yeah, I yeah, I was in a, a long term relationship uh, in high school and it was 
I mean, it's high school, right? So, but there was love. And there was a point at which we were going in separate directions. Again, the codependent in me wasn't able to, you know, make those decisions until my current partner showed up and I still have shame and guilt around giving up on the previous relationship to marry this person. My husband, I've realized, is very similar in ways to my parents. There's been both times where I've thought, I married my mother. And then there's other times I thought, I married my father. (laughs) Yeah, it's so confusing. But I think back to, had the ex-boyfriend been meaner during that breakup, what would my path have looked like? Because with my husband, I was friends with his sister, and both of them would drop things on me like, well, you're not going to hurt him, are you? Uh, I'm not going to wait around forever for you. Him being the husband. Between yeah. the two of them, they're doing this kind of sense of urgency. So you had the the ex-boyfriend essentially making it easy for you in terms of not guilting you or shaming you, behaving like a decent person. <laughs> right. He was just expressing his his love and not wanting to me to leave. Had he been mean and said, called me things and said, da, 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 I would have been torn between two, more torn. And like you, Brian, you've said that before. Like if there's two people, one's a narcissist and one isn't, there's a tendency to want to, to want to please that person. Mm-hmm. The one that's demanding it. The one that's demanding it. Yeah. It's like throwing yourself on a bomb, right? Like you, you want to, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the threat that you need to address. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And then cue the guilt and shame. Like I would hear things like, I hope you don't hurt my brother. This was when I was friends with his sister and you're so good for each other. And, you know, and from him, I heard all the same things. He wants to get married. He wants to have kids. He wants to do all these things. Right. So cue the Catholic guilt. What are you supposed to do after you grow up? You're supposed to get married and have children. There was no other way to go. So you had the social script that was already telling you what you should be and how you should be. And then you had these people come in and say like, okay, well, we're going to help you fulfill this script. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You found it. This is the guy. (laughs) Yeah. And then the love bombing. Like I I re-listened to um, your guys' season five, the one where you didn't have the guest on narcissism last night. And I was like, holy man, can I see every single thing you say? I have a memory that's associated with it. So yeah, even, you know, when we were dating and, you know, I threw out there like, let's get married. Um, But I wanted to wait until I was finished school and I was away for school. So it was long distance. So we really didn't spend a lot of time together. What I would hear from his sister is that he's super sad and lonely when you're not around. So, oh, that makes me feel good as the codependent. I can save him. So that's where that it all began. And yeah, I remember saying, I don't want to be engaged during school. Well, I graduated on a Friday. Four days later was our second anniversary and we got engaged. And I remember wanting to say no. Oh, you do. Oh yeah. Clear as day. And I couldn't because the pressure, I had said this, this is what I was told that I should want. He loves me. Anybody ask if I love him? Nope. Right. Doesn't matter. Or or what does that even mean? I think that's an excellent point, right? Right. Like if you're not used to asking that of yourself, then then you're just going to assume that that's the case. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. And actually, Stephanie, that's something that you have really taught me in this is that the wants and the needs, nobody's ever spoken about it the way you do. And it's like when you were dealing with codependent Brian earlier on and you guys had issues see I was raised to just push through those issues if there were them whereas you stop and say this might not work and it's like hello yeah exactly why wasn't that ever mentioned to me in fact I can think of when I was dating the ex in high school my mom you know I'd be upset about whatever or or I'd be in a rut and she'd kind of push me to get out of this relationship. He probably wouldn't be married, uh, ready for marriage till 30. He wouldn't have, want kids until then. I'd have to wait so long. Like like 30 is really that late in life. <laughs> Give me a break. 
And then when I was complaining about my husband, but when we were dating, I remember my mom, she knew that he wanted marriage and kids. And so she downplayed my issue. And I didn't really realize that until a few months back. I thought she wanted me to end that relationship in high school. So she pushed me towards it. I was unsure about my boyfriend that I married, but she knew he would give me the things that she wanted. So she didn't talk me out of it. She dismissed my concerns. Yeah, you had a lot of people directing you and what you were supposed to be doing. (laughs) Yeah. That relationship. Yeah, it was so confusing. And it felt like, okay, well, this is this is a script, a social script. This is what I've been told. He loves me. We can have a good life. I guess this is what we're gonna do. 20 years later, it'll be 20 years in July. And I lied to myself for a long time, or not lied, but I just wasn't aware. Codependency kept me doing what I was raised to do. So I've been in this on and off discovery for a long, long time. And I'm noticing that the um, cognitive dissonance is less and less. So just a couple weeks ago, we had an argument, we had a fight, of course, we patched it up a little bit. And all of a sudden, I'm back feeling this way. So there's less time in between when I'm lying to myself. And I think that's that just is coming with age and just trusting myself, really. Well, I think this is a really interesting st- story in that, yeah, you're coming to these realizations while in a relationship that triggers your codependent behaviors. I think that's really impressive because it's difficult for me to imagine myself making any progress on my codependency when I was in one of those relationships. They, it was just, I, I had so many de- defenses set up and, you know, including the emotional avoidance. You're connecting to your emotions. Yeah, I am. I just don't believe in them fully mm-hmm. yet. Yeah, it's going to take some experience of acting on them. And then cue the guilt and the shame that comes with, well, I made these decisions knowing it wasn't right. So it's my fault. But on the other hand, I made these decisions because that's how I was forced to think of myself and the role I have in this life. So there's guilt and then there's not guilt. It's a mind mess. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, it's it's tempting to to want to s- swing in these extremes to like, oh, it was all my fault. Yes, uh, you know, and like just wallow in the shame kind of. And then to the other, to the other extreme being like, it's everyone else's fault. Everyone else told me what it, I was just doing what I was told. But what you're shooting for is a combination somewhere in, in the middle where you had responsibility, you did certain things, but then other people had responsibilities and, and did things. And it's figuring out what, what all of that was and how, how it worked. There's been probably, I don't know, five, six situations that have happened between friends, my dad, my husband in the past few weeks that I'm able to approach differently out of my codependent ways because of the learning I've done. One way I try to connect with my dad is by sending goofy Instagram posts about people falling and people, uh, you know, just goofy things. And that was something I learned in therapy, where if you don't have a relationship, how can you connect with somebody? So I've been sending these things back and forth. I know he's laughing at them. And he sends me a text about two weeks ago. He goes, you really like to see people fail. Man, was I triggered by that. Wow. And that's so off yeah. <laughs> right? like, as it's to like, what you were doing right. right and it's just so i i reread it a few times and what i've learned about myself is that if it continues to bother me till the next day or three four days later it's something that needs to be addressed so i think i've mentioned to you guys before i'm a runner and i listen to your podcast when i run and i that's when i do a lot of my deep thinking and i thought no i'm gonna respond in a way that honors me and I, I just posted back. I said, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that I like to see people fail. I would say that if people are going to post funny things like this, then I'm going to laugh, period. That was it. And I was going to see him the next day and I was ready. I was ready for the conversation that was going to happen. But the part of me that changed was I wasn't going to shame vent to him. So I prepared myself and I thought if he brings it up, I'm going to take a moment to think about what he said and how I'm going to respond. And then I thought years ago, I would have given him a hug and said, and then brought up this whole conversation. And I didn't. He gave me a hug. I waited for it. He didn't mention it. I didn't mention it. 
moved on. So it was like, I finally wasn't trying to get somebody to understand me. I understood myself and I stood in what I knew. As simple as that conversation was, it was so difficult too. So that shame venting that you guys talk about so often is, oh, I have so much, so many experiences and memories where I did that and then had guilt about it after. Gosh, right? So like that other, uh, that Chris that you had on too, he said he has relationships, relationship A, relationship B, or something like that, where he lets certain people in and he, he only he keeps some people at a distance. And I'm starting to put people in those categories as I get older. And there's less and less people in the category of me being fully myself. And it's both, I'm happy about it, But it's also sad. In that you're realizing how many people aren't in plan A. Do you think that you do have some of those relationships so that you can be your authentic self with? Yeah, I do. I've, I have a couple of really great girlfriends and a couple of um, co-workers that, that I'm able to be, be myself with. Are they aware of your struggle with codependency? Um, uh, I wouldn't say that they're, I wouldn't say the codependency term, but they're aware of well, they're aware of my relationship struggles, but I guess I haven't really been open about the only person that's really been aware of it is I've I've had a therapist who didn't dismiss my labeling, the labeling of myself as codependent. I have one very close friend who is also going through emotional stuff. And I, I, I share a lot with her, but I'm also... I don't agree with everything she says, which is fine. She's also in the circle of our friendship in our friend group, right? So so she's trying to give advice probably from my husband's perspective too. Not 100%. There's nobody that truly knows what I think and feel every day, except for me. It must be a little lonely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is, but there's safety in that. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Exactly. That, yeah. I mean, are you thinking about any of these relationships that you would like to try to move to that next level of intimacy with? Because it's a really valuable thing to be able to share these things and, and have a back and forth dialogue. Probably my closest friend, I would and could. But then part of me is like, but what am I trying to gain from that? If I know this, I can't I can't decide, Am I am I not wanting to be vulnerable to her? Or is it not worth sharing with her? Because I know these things to be true already. That's the struggle. Well, from my experience, how how much can you really know all on your own? Just from my own experience being that codependency is uh, an interpersonal issue, right? So to think about it on your own, you know, you can figure out a lot of things by looking at your past and looking at your current behaviors, but then without really getting feedback firsthand from other people, I think you can only go so far in knowing whether you really are being true to yourself. Are you really spotting the behaviors? Well, then I guess, then I guess I don't. The only person would be that probably my most recent therapist. But again, she doesn't know me. She knows me in terms of our therapy. And what you bring what you bring her. Yeah. I'll speak from the friend point of view too, that, you know, you were saying, is it worth it sharing with her? You know, that's obviously a risk. You're being vulnerable. But when people have shared those things with me, even say Brian, it's it's a tremendous gift. I have felt it as a gift and an honor. It's transformed my relationship with that person. And also I learn a lot about myself when pe- people come and share that kind of thing. I'm just thinking, you know, for instance, it sounds like you listened to the Chris episode where he talks about kind of essentially coming out to his partner and then that really kind of transforming their relationship in a profound way. Okay. I'm noticing that <laughs> I'm getting teary-eyed here because clearly this is a trigger or something is happening. <laughs> See, when when my husband and I are in when it's when things are not good, but we're able to talk about some things. So he, he's he's codependent Brian 70-80% of the time. That's how he is. He's either he's inauthentic. There's mm-hmm. a list of myriad of of things there's the the uh, reflexive dishonesty the lack of vulnerability the liar the protector of self all of that stuff but when i am truly being open and and really he's being forced to that's what i wish he was like 95 percent of the time and he's not he's not capable because of his own issues i wish that i could be fully open with him about my codependency so that I could explain to him 
why we're having issues and how I want out. Mm -hmm. Are you paralyzing yourself with dialogue on that? I found myself did that all the time. Like if I have to have, I feel as though I need to have a conversation with someone and then I have the conversation in my head for like a month or more. Oh, years. <laughs> yeah. <right>? Years. <laughs> And then you finally have it and it's just like, okay, nope, that went, that went terribly. All right. I'm never going to do that again. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This belief, if you can figure out exactly the right thing to say, mm -hmm. then that's going to, that's going to convince the other person to be a different person really actually, essentially. Right. Literally, I have a note, uh, notes of what I wanted to say to you guys today. My last sentence is how do I put my thoughts and words down where I stand in what I know, what I need, what I want without the guilt and shame and feel like I have to caretake the other. That is, I know what I know. <laughs> that conversation, that's the brick wall. That is like death to me, plus the fallout of that. I mean, we've broken up a few times. We've separated a, a few times. And it's that conversation and the fallout after that paralyzes me. I have to say, I mean, I totally, I, I left a long-term marriage and I 100% understand and remember that feeling, that feeling of, you know, there are people that I love and that I would be responsible for hurting them. It's just a terrifying feeling. I didn't have the background that, that you have where it wasn't just people that you love that you don't want to hurt is pretty much everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's time to say at this point, anybody. Right. So f facing that, yeah. It's impossible. It's hard. It is, yeah. I mean, I say it's impossible, but I, I know I've got to face it at some point. Well, you know, and the, but the fact that you're saying this out loud is already pretty good, I think. <laughs> Brian's <Seriously>. impressed. <laughs> I am. I, I had help, you know, and that's why I recommend opening up to whoever, to, you know, your best friend to, to have someone in your corner that you can, you know, you may start to go, OK, here's the fake conversations I've been having for two years in my head. <laughs> and they'll go, mm, OK, maybe you don't just you don't need to to have those fake conversations. Just go just go try. But yeah, I mean, just to. Having, having having someone that you can actually run this stuff by is huge. It was for me. Yeah, even one person to say, yeah. yes, you were allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like when I left the second J relationship, um, yeah, I found myself doing that, like fi finding the need to come up with this list of pros and cons and all these things that I was going to say to argue my position for why I was allowed to leave the relationship, more or less. That's kind of what it looked like. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Argue and your point. Is, so maybe you can speak to Brian when you left that relationship because you didn't even like her at that point. Yeah. Right. And it would still, do you remember that moment where you decided that you were going to tell her? Or? Well, I mean, I was, tr I was, it was really rough because I kept trying to convince myself not to. And then even when I did consider, con convince myself that I had to, because of this overwhelming shame, that relationship was finally kind of exposed to a point where I couldn't deny that it was bad anymore. And other people could see it. But I was still, yeah, it's just like, do I have a right? You know, like, am I allowed to do this? Well, that's that's what I've learned from Stephanie through this, mm -hmm. is that I do have the right. Because that's important. I mean, that is super important. Yeah. But then even when you decided to do it. Yeah, right. I know. Still it paralyzed. took a while, right? When I actually did do it, I just kind of stumbled into it. So I, I was paralyzing myself with, with these conversations and everything. But how then, to present it to her. Yeah, how to present it. How am I going to have this argument? You know, how am I going to bring it up? How's it going to look? You know, when she says this, I will say this. When she says this, I will say hmm. this. But then when it finally came, I didn't, none of that mattered because the conversation came and it was just this awkward. And she forced the conversation. Yeah, she kind of forced the, the conversation. She could tell something was wrong. And I was like, you know what? I don't see a future for this relationship. That wow. was it. Boom. I just, that's all I said. <laughs> how did you, so how did you do that though? But there were eyes on the, on the relationship and yeah. you had said to a number of people that mm -hmm. you were going to end it. Yeah. The whole kind of throw your hat over the, the wall. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was the, the shame of, Not of, doing it. of now these eyes on that relationship. And it, it was just undeniable that, that I was making a massive mistake being there and staying there um, mm -hmm. versus the fear of doing it, the fear of, of ending that relationship, which was the fear was so bad that I avoided the fear. So I, I, it was, I had a, a hard time just admitting to myself that I was afraid, but the, the shame just outweighed all that. 
to where I was just like, okay, I have to do this. But it's still, it was still a lot of fear on how to do it, how to actually go through with it. And then after you did it, the, the, this feeling of still just right. overwhelming. Oh my God, this is terrible. This is the most horrible thing ever, you know, because, because as expected, of course, you know, she's hurt, she's angry, all that. But was there also a sense of, it was like you were a balloon and you could finally just let out all the air or did that take a while? That took a while. It took a while because I still was not, yeah, I was still not, I wasn't free of that relationship for a while. You know, like I just. Not only weren't you free in that sh- she had access to you for, for quite a while. Yeah, that's true. But also, yeah. even after that stopped, mm-hmm. it took a while to kind of exercise that relationship. Yeah, well, because I still had to, I couldn't face that much shame all at once. So I had to still hold on to certain elements as if like, okay, well, there must have been something fine you know so i would describe the middle years of the relationship as fine and all these things like i just like there had to be something legitimate about that why would i put myself through that oh yeah for sure there's i struggle with that all the time you know we've got that just like your family growing up my family growing up there are good things but there's this overarching issue that just won't go away well and it's okay if there aren't good things too I mean, that's that's another thing that I had to, you know, come to terms with is uh, like I can forgive myself for the fact that I was in a relationship that was irredeemable. That was just it was not supposed to be there. Yeah. And sometimes I think and actually I know that if we were to end, that we would probably actually be better friends and he would be more authentic. I think being married to me before I started standing up for myself, his narcissism would come out a lot more. And it worked because it scared me. But as I've started to get stronger, I mean, I've been more educated. I have, I make more money than him. I I have a great job. Um, I'm able to speak well when I've had some time to think about what I want to say. I know a lot of who I am and that scares him. So that pushes him into these codependent ways that I'm seeing now because he knows he can't be the narcissist because that to me is no, absolutely not. All these other behaviors of, I can tell, I can tell the moment that he is triggered and he goes into switching the subject his face face changes, I can tell and, and I can appreciate that he's triggered. But I keep thinking that if we didn't have the pressure that both of our families put on us to be married, da, 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 that those are the successful kind of milestones, right? Marriage, kids, da, 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 da. I know he would probably be able to let his foot off the gas and be himself. He'll never ever be the one to pull the plug. It'll be me. He'll make you do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I thought about that too. He's he's he can't have that shame on him. If I do it, he can blame me. And that's something that I've well, I haven't come to terms with it. Otherwise I would have done it by now, but I can I can recognize that more. I've always been the one to blame. He can't he he'll turn it around on me in a second. Doesn't do it as much as he used to because I call him on it. I recognize it and call him on it. But that was his go-to for years, and pff, it worked like a charm. Sounds yeah. like this is maybe the last, the final battle that you have. It sounds like you've socially and professionally and intellectually made strides in, in terms of developing a sense of agency and power, And but this is often the last battle for a lot of people, that, mm-hmm. that interpersonal space, that space that takes you way back. <laughs> yeah, that actually gives me chills a little bit. It does. It feels like the last it's this, I know that that finish line, it's coming eventually. And like you said, Brian, it's like, it's either going to happen in two ways where I write long letter and read it and end it, or I just lose my shit one day and say, this is it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and that's probably how it's going to go the latter. I don't know. Because yeah, I, I tried a letter thing with, with Jay in, a, in a, earlier in the relationship of just, I'm going to read all my grievances basically. And that did not go well. <laughs> I've done that so many times. So many times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, like this, this whole idea, which, you know, when you're trained as a, you know, if I'm, perfect. If I say things perfectly, if I present it perfectly, then this person is going to be different than mm-hmm. they have been right. every other They're time. going to start treating me better magically. Right, right. Like, it, it, which is, uh, that's the codependent reflex, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's something, something about me that yeah. I can change. I can present it better. I can say it better. I can, I can act differently and they'll be different. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which isn't fair to them. 
True. Right. Yeah. And I'm trying not to be too codependent also, right? But like really, that's the controlling part. I like I, listening to that the narcissist season five one. Oh, I just hate listening to the part where I'm controlling because I have never been controlling, or at least I thought I never was controlling. And hearing that just oh, it just like it's just it's a trigger. It's like, that is what I'm doing. I bet recently I've been doing a lot of dissecting of the word controlling um, and figuring out the nuances of, of ways it looks. I won't get, get into that here, but it's been pretty satisfying and eye-opening to really, I've been able to con- kind of forgive myself a little more by the, the ways in which I was controlling because of the motivations of, of those actions and what I knew was driving it and who was the scared boy trying to keep himself safe, stuff like that. Yeah. And I've just been a, a scared little girl. It, it, you know, talking about the ways that we think this conversation is going to go. I do remember thinking back to when my parents were in an argument, which seemed to be a lot of the time. I remember as much as my dad can be passive aggressive and my mom was louder, it always seemed like my mom was just kind of being the bitch and my dad was just laying down and taking it. I mean, as I've grown up, I've realized that he definitely was poking the bear. She just was more comfortable saying it out loud. Um, I remember as a kid thinking, I just wish he would turn around and tell her to shut up. Hmm. And I never saw him do that. Or, you know, not shut up, but obviously to put his foot down, to demand some sort of respect, to speak up for himself. And I never saw that. And I'm wondering too... Is that impacting my ability? I never saw that. I never saw that as an option. He just turtled and would find these other maladaptive ways to whatever, get his needs met or... Assert himself. Assert himself, yeah. And it usually was in a passive aggressive way. Yeah. Or resentment in his head. Like, yeah. Now he's going to spend the next two weeks just going like, this is what I should have said. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. And then shame venting on top of that. Then we'd have to hear about it. And then it's like they're pinning their child against each other. Like I still go, if I go to their house and I know that my dad comes into the room, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting to have, I'm waiting for the day where I have to say, if you guys continue to argue, I will leave. And I'm prepared to say that. It's going to be hard, but, um, and I'm ready for them to say, we're not fighting. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Right? This is how we talk to each other (laughs) all the time. And then cue the confusion in me. Right. Right. Like, but I think they're fighting. I'm feeling incredibly uncomfortable in the moment, but yet they're telling me they're not. I don't know what's, you know, happening here. Oh, therefore, I'm not going to trust myself. I'm just going to sit here in this awkwardness. Right. My feelings are, are I can't trust my feelings. No. They're, they're telling me something different. And yeah. if I leave, how is my leaving going to affect them? So I'm taking on way too much responsibility in stuff that is not even close to being any of mine. My responsibility is the boundary that I don't want to hear it and I'll leave. So why isn't that enough? Well, it sounds like you have already been setting some boundaries and, and exercising. I mean, the, the, just the, the one you told about the dad's comment about sending the, the videos and stuff like that. Yeah, you're, you're starting to change your behaviors and that's all you can do. Yeah. Slowly but surely. I know you probably don't feel this right now, but this seems like a very hopeful story to me, yeah. Rebecca. I mean, really, just as Brian was saying earlier, the, the amount of work that you've done while still in the middle of all of this, yeah. like juggling all of these balls, it's it's really, it's really impressive. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard. It sounds hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we just want to thank you again for sh- sharing this with us and honoring us with this conversation that you've been having in your head for years to, to bring it to us and, and to allow other people who are probably in a very similar situation to, to hear what you're thinking about and how you're feeling. I think it's going to be helpful for a lot of people who are probably in very similar situations. Yes, I think it's going to give a lot of people strength and just some motivation to, to do these kind of listen to themselves. Yeah, I hope that for people. Uh, the older that I get, the more I realize there's probably so many people going through this and either not knowing or just starting to know. Or like you, Brian, you've got to the other side. There is another side. Yeah, there definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we have seen it. Yeah. yeah. And, and and we hope that, that you, you find your way there, Rebecca. And we hope that for all the listeners. And we hope the listeners will join us 
in a couple of weeks for another episode. <laughs>